Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our last panel of the day. Um, and it's a rainy afternoon uh, for those of us here in the Northeast, probably everywhere. Um, so I hope you're all warm and and still uh, um, absorbed. I see most of you are. There's lots of questions. Um, and we have Emily Riley um, in our um, uh, on our staff today working for the last um, uh, session. She'll be pulling in your questions and providing some links as well when we uh, when we need it when our speakers talk about them. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce um, uh, Amy Borer, our Justice Systems Analyst for the National Juvenile Defender Center, and Josh Rovner, uh, for a Senior Advocacy Associate for the Sentencing Project. Um, this panel really beautifully ties together a lot of the themes we've been discussing uh, this afternoon. Um, uh, it's kind of a, a combined title, uh, Strengthening the Rights and Protecting the Health of Justice Involved Youth, um, and the two are are obviously interconnected, especially now. So uh, what I'd like to do is maybe bring on um, uh, uh, Josh first, and maybe he can talk a little bit about some of the themes um, that he's talked about, particularly in the school to prison pipeline, which is a, a phrase that we all know, and we hope uh, is starting to get a lot more attention um, uh, now, particularly in, in the time of COVID. So uh, Josh, if you're there, um, uh, the gavel is yours. Thank you so much, Stephen, and, and really thank you, John Jay, for putting this together. I am so thankful, you know, in, in a time with so much news that the attendance from the media is so strong today. I think it's really a testament to the work that you've done here. Uh, I put together a few slides. I'm very eager to hear your questions. We'll just be some background for about 15 minutes. So, Stephen, if, if you could load that up. Um, I handle a wide portfolio of issues for the sentencing project, and, and part of my job does entail talking to the media. So I hope that today is not the last time that we'll be talking to each other. Um, but today I'll be talking about the school to prison pipeline, um, about how school policies can lead kids into the justice system, but simply don't have to. So let's go to the second slide, because we really need to start here from the fact that schools are safe places. The main justification for putting police in school fall, fails as soon as you realize this fact. Schools are safe and they're getting safer over time. Kids are doing well and that is also getting better over time. The graph that you see here comes from the Department of Education and Department of Justice's indicators of school crime and safety. It shows total reported violent victimizations among students going back to 1991. The darker green line shows the violent victimizations at school, and the light green line shows violent victimizations away from school. The violence shown here is mostly simple assault, but you'd see the same trends for thefts. You'd also see the same trends for serious violence, things like aggravated assault and shooting, but that's a very small slice of school-based offending. Now, there's two things I really want you to notice. First is the trends, which I already mentioned. Uh, things are getting much safer. The rate of students who are victims of violence continues to drop, as does the crime rate overall, especially when it comes to teenagers. This graphs another data point on that uh, evidence for that. Um, now, I graduated from high school in 1993 on the left side of the graph, which coincidentally is the peak uh, on the left side. And that year, over 2.2 million students uh, were victims of a violent offense in schools. And that averaged out to 91 per thousand students. In the most recent year, uh, that fell to 20 to 2,500 victimizations, which meant 24,000, 24 per thousand on the graph, falling from 91 to 24. A second, notice that violent victimizations in school are much higher than the violent victimizations away from school. This is not a compelling argument for the presence of school resource officers patrolling the hallways. Kids are actually safer outside of schools than inside of schools. A closer look at the data uh, elsewhere in the same report, but not shown here, shows that white youth are more likely to be victims than black or Latino youth, but it's not a huge difference. We see big gaps emerge between rural schools where violence is much more common than elsewhere. It's actually about twice as high as in urban or suburban schools. So let's move to the next slide. 
because those differences in geography matter a great deal because of the way that our, our neighborhoods are residentially segregated. You're looking at a map of Detroit uh, from the 2010 census, and there's a green blob in the middle of the graph. We're looking at Detroit, and that's African-Americans uh, living in Detroit, surrounded mostly by um, a lake of blue, which is uh, white people, according to the 2010 census. That sharp line, which uh, looked a little sharper on my screen than it does here, that's Eight Mile Road, separating uh, white neighborhoods from black neighborhoods. And I don't mean to pick on Wayne County, Michigan here, because if you click on that map, uh, University of Virginia put it out, it's called the racial dot map. Zoom in on almost any big city in the country and you will see similar patterns. And what this means is that our most schools are segregated as well. Studies show two important things about segregation when it comes to student discipline. First, that school districts with mostly youth of color are more likely to have zero tolerance policies that, student, that punish their students more harshly. And second, in the integrated districts, black students are generally treated much more harshly than their white peers for the same behaviors. White youth misbehavior is considered a medical problem to be treated and black youth misbehavior is considered criminal. Uh, next slide, please. Now, in practice, the school to prison pipeline is not a two-way path. I, I do read stories about kids acting up in school and getting arrested and detained that same day. And that certainly is appalling. These stories have not stopped just because schools are physically closed. Kids are getting in trouble for not doing their homework or not logging into class, things that violate the terms of their probation, um, not the underlying offense. Um, there's usually an underlying offense along the lines of a, a simple assault or drug possession. So not doing homework by itself doesn't get anyone locked up as far as I know. There was a recent story out of Michigan where a girl was arrested for fighting with her mother, and after failing to complete homework assignments, a judge in Michigan determined that she needed to be incarcerated. Her mother, the actual victim of the underlying crime, did not want that to happen, but she was incarcerated for about nine months nevertheless. Um, I also believe that when a serious offense happens on school grounds, it's a misnomer to consider that to be the entrance to the school to prison pipeline. Drug sales are against the law, and whether that happens in a high school bathroom or a public park, uh, either way, a kid who gets caught doing that is likely to be arrested for it. What's much more common is the aggressive use of uh, exclusionary discipline that leads to dropout. Pushout is probably the better term for it because kids who are suspended or expelled are far less likely to graduate, and young adults without a diploma are far more likely to be arrested. And the other thing that's common is uh, treating ordinary adolescent misbehaviors, things like being obnoxious to teachers or skipping school or getting into shoving matches in the hall as being elevated to a criminal act, partly due to state laws, but uh, more likely due to the presence of so-called school resource officers. Uh, some of my colleagues absolutely hate that term because police in schools are not really a resource for the kids themselves in any meaningful sense. I already showed you that schools are safe places and getting safer. So the main role that SROs play is in escalating behavioral or discipline issues, things that used to earn detention when I was in high school in suburban Massachusetts, into something that the courts can address. Uh, let's move to the next slide. In practice, this can have incredibly appalling uh, results. The headlines are pretty small on your screen. Uh, all you really need to do is do a news search on your own for a child arrested elementary school. You'll find these stories too. The crime report just had a great op-ed that linked to a couple of these stories also. It's usually a child with a learning disorder. It's often a child with autism. And just speaking anecdotally, it's almost always a child of color. What's interesting to me is that the public seems to intuitively understand the outrage here when a seven-year-old is arrested. That photo, oh, I'm sorry, we're looking at the earlier version of this. Um, but there was a, a story uh, out of a 14-year-old, excuse me, a 10-year-old who during a dodgeball game uh, got arrested for aggravated assault for an aggressive version of dodgeball. It's easy to imagine the trauma or the scar from this experience. And for some reason, many of us lack the same compassion in talking about a 14-year-old 
who's also acting out in age appropriate, which is to say annoying ways. Teenagers are going to test authority. Teenagers are going to make bad decisions, especially in the presence of their peers. We were all teenagers, so we know this, right? But what the system lacks is a patience and compassion for teenage mistakes. And that gets a lot worse when police are the ones empowered to make decisions. We all know the saying, when you're holding a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail. Well, when your uh, government issued uniform comes with handcuffs, the whole world looks like a suspect. Let's go on to the next slide. Um, so let's advance one and we'll come back to this one. So uh, this was a high profile example of over policing in school with teenagers. The story started when the girl in the desk refused to put her cell phone away in class. Uh, the girl in the lower right hand corner is not the one in the desk and I'll get to her in just a minute. The girl was texting, which is against the rules, and that's a pretty standard classroom management issue. But the teacher opted to call the school resource officer, who acted in the way that you can see in the photos here. See, in South Carolina, disturbing schools was a misdemeanor. The school has two school resource officers, and the one who responded was known to the students as, quote, Officer Slam. The girl in the lower right corner reacted in the way uh, the rest of us probably would, seeing a large man pummel one of our classmates. She started yelling at the police officer. She probably swore at the police officer. She, too, was arrested. And what's interesting to note here is that there are three people in these photos. Two of them were arrested, and the one who was not arrested is the police officer, who, I should concede, was, in fact, um, fired for doing so. Now, the story doesn't quite end there, in part because of these events and the shame they brought to the state, South Carolina amended its disturbing schools law in 2018 to only apply to people who are not enrolled as students. And it was pretty successful. Disturbing schools arrests for students fell by half in one year from 1,300 to uh, 600, uh, 500, 1,300 to 600, 500. And yet youth arrests for disorderly conduct spiked in a handful of counties in that same year. Changing the laws alone will not solve these problems when the mentality is that kids' problems should be addressed by police and courts instead of by counselors. So let's back up a sec. Because school pushout is another issue that we need to address. This chart has the most recent data on students receiving out-of-school suspensions. Uh, which is another punishment received by that girl in addition to being pummeled by the police officer in front of her classmates. That suspension was upheld. Now, because there's a lot of numbers on this chart, I'd like you to focus on the numbers in the red circles. Um, the first number that you see uh, on the left side um, circles, um, so this is white African and white male students, uh, of whom five out of 5% of them were arrested in the school year shown. And for black male students, the arrest uh, suspensions were one in six, it's about 17%. So you can see how much more common it is there. For girls, which is the, the um, slice right to the ne right, uh, next of it, 9.6% of black girls were suspended over the course of a school year, and 1.7% of white girls were uh, suspended in the school year. About five and a half percent more common for the girls, and you can see about three times more common uh, for the boys. So um, that kind of disparity is something that you see constantly through the juvenile justice system. Black youth are more likely to be arrested. They're much more likely to be detained. They're more likely to be committed long term. At every step of the process, the disparities grow. So. Let's move forward a couple slides to things that we can actually do about this. Some of the solutions, because we have seen solutions to these problems. Start with the young kids from a couple minutes ago. In many states, the minimum age of juvenile court jurisdiction is at least 10, meaning that the police cannot arrest a nine-year-old for making felony terrorist threats any more than they could arrest a baby. In two states, that age is 12, which is the standard that advocates are generally pushing for. Second, pulling police out of schools is an important step, and parents are having some success ending police department's contracts with their school districts. Absent that, which is a difficult step, 
Schools and police can sign memoranda of understanding that police can only enforce violations of the law where student safety is at risk and not enforce discipline rules. Third, schools need to eliminate their zero tolerance policies. These policies have led students to getting punished for having toy guns in the background during their Zoom calls or kindergartners getting suspended for bringing cigarettes to school. We need to start using our brains and not inflexible policies. These are kids we're talking about. And lastly, we break the school to prison pipeline by investing in counseling and not police. Data from the ACLU shows 10 million students are in schools with police but no social workers. Uh, 1.7 million of them are in schools with police but no counselors. This is a ridiculous way to allocate our resources. In, in Marin County, California, SROs earn twice as much as school social workers. So I'm very happy to uh, take your questions as we move on. Another thing I've been working on is uh, the, the presence of COVID in schools. And Jessica Fireman on that last presentation used some of the data that I've gathered. I, I hope that you'll go to the Sentencing Project website. I put together a report about a month ago. Um, and I just hope that um, you'll be able to make use of this. Uh, Josh, I just want to follow up with a very quick question since you sure. mentioned COVID. I know Amy is going to go into that. But obviously, um, COVID now has changed what schools look like, what they are, what half of it is online, half of it isn't online. How has it changed the prospects for the school to prison pipeline? I mean, does it make it a lot easier now and there's a lot less discipline that's going on? Obviously, there's nothing to discipline if there's no kids in school. You know, the, the first impact that we've seen is that youth arrests are way down, uh, much more than one would expect, uh, given a lot of other factors. And I think the reason that that has happened is that the fact that the schools have been closed and that the police are not in position to arrest kids for simple assault when they get into a fight in the hallway or disorderly conduct when they swear at their teachers. So that has been a major impact. On the other hand, we've seen preposterous stories about, you know, there was a 12 year old seventh grader in Colorado who, you know, I did this as a prop. I have a Nerf gun behind me right now. And a kid was suspended because you're not allowed to have guns on campus at a school, at that school district in Colorado suspended for a Nerf gun. I mean, it said zombie killer on it. So what we see with the juvenile justice system is its resilience. It will find ways to punish kids, whether it's whether there's any purpose to it or not. And that's where the zero tolerance policies are such a wreck for us. Um, so there's been a positive impact in that SROs are not in position to refer kids, but we've also seen some anecdotal stories of kids being sent to the courts or suspended for things that are hardly worthy of that response. I mean, we do know because we've been told by psychologists and, and, um, and other specialists that the trauma has increased for those kids who are in school, um, even temporarily because of COVID. So that theoretically might increase problems with discipline and problems of control in the classroom. Yeah, I mean, we're all going nuts, right? I mean, this is not an easy time for any of us. So you combine that with a kid living, you know, in a neighborhood where he's got to wear a mask every time he goes out or his mom has lost his job. You know, I'm pretty comfortable working out of my bedroom here in Silver Spring and I'm going nuts. And I'm sure that all of you listening to this are having our own problems going through it. And we don't have teenage brains, right? Like we're much more capable, supposedly, of dealing with these problems. So I think that the discipline problems that teachers are dealing with are predictable. I think that, you know, you talked about experts, they're predicted too. And you just really hope that the teachers and the, the administrators will have comp some compassion for what the kids are going through. Zero tolerance policies eliminate the space for that compassion. That's all. Amy, yeah. over to you. Thank you so much, Steve. I am going to um, share my screen, if that's all right with you guys. There we go. Okay, so are you guys seeing my PowerPoint slide? I just want to make sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you to Steve and Josh and to John Jay. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, so the I love the title of Josh and my um, little panel here about strengthening the rights and protecting the health of justice involved youth. And when I was trying to figure out what aspect of that to focus on, because it's a pretty wide ranging thing, what really grabbed my attention in the agenda for the for this John Jay event was actually the subtitle of the entire event. 
um, the impact of today's health, economic, and social crises on youth justice reform. And as I was kind of pondering that and trying to figure out where to focus my remarks, um, what I realized is that this is an unprecedented time, obviously, that we're all going through and this trifecta of crises uh, that we're experiencing. It hasn't really changed the juvenile legal system, not fundamentally. It's changed it around the edges. Um, what I think it has done, though, is actually just revealed what the system has always been. So what do I mean by that? Let's go through each of these here quickly. So what has the COVID pandemic revealed to us about what we've always known about the juvenile legal system? Well, we have always known that young people's safety and health are actually at greater risk when they're removed from their homes and put into facilities. What has the economic crisis revealed? That the system preys on youth who come from families with economic disadvantages, and then that system levies other costs and fees that burden those families. And then the social unrest, the demands for racial justice, um, all that has really revealed is what's already existed in the system, which is that Black, Latinx, Native, and other youth of color, like Josh has just told us about the school to prison pi pipeline, are disproportionately criminalized, arrested, and incarcerated. These are all things that the system has always been. Um, and what the COVID crisis and the other crises of the year 2020 have done is just highlighted those, brought them to the top. Um, so let's <clears throat> go through each one with just a little bit more detail. So youth health in the juvenile legal system, even before 2020, what we knew is that involvement in the juvenile legal system um, harms youth and harms their physical health. And youth who are incarcerated for even as short a time as less than one month, cumulative, so over their entire um, youth and adolescence, if they are incarcerated for less than one month, cumulative, um, they are more likely to have depression as adults. And then as that cumulative incarceration increases, um, their risk for health uh, issues as adults increases. So cumulative incarceration of one to 12 months means worse general health outcomes. And then incarceration over a year, uh, functional limitations, depressive systems, and suicidal thoughts as adults. So we already knew this. Uh, this is what the system does to these kids even before the year 2020. So since March, um, since the COVID pandemic hit the U.S. and courts have been shutting down and all of us have been working from home, um, we've been reaching out. My organization, the National Juvenile Defender Center, uh, is doing what we're calling our COVID Defender Interview Project, where we're interviewing a little over 50 juvenile defenders who are frontline defenders um, and asking about their experiences um, representing youth during the pandemic. And not surprisingly, what they're telling us is they are very worried about the health and safety of their clients. They're very worried about the um, mental health and well-being of their clients. And then also they're having to balance their duty and commitment to their clients uh, with their own health and with their family's health, knowing that if they go to a facility to meet with their uh, clients, if they go to court, they're exposing themselves as well to the potential of COVID and bringing it home to their families. So in addition to the long-term negative health impacts that we knew were happening in the system, there are now immediate health impacts, right? These facilities are not clean. There's no social distancing. Uh, there are COVID outbreaks. Josh and his organization have done amazing work um, tracking this. There's no central uh, repository uh, that is telling us where and how many um, COVID cases there are in juvenile facilities. And Josh has single-handedly been doing that. And that's information that my organization and lots of folks are using. Um, mental well-being is also being detrimentally affected, as you can imagine. Uh, lots of facilities, when they need to quarantine youth, are putting them in solitary confinement, which has immediate and long-term mental health impacts. So the economic crisis in juvenile court, uh, and I think this I only came in at the end of the panel before us, but I suspect that this was part of the discussion there, which is the, the fines and fees that are levied uh, through the juvenile court system and the detrimental impact that that has on youth and families. Uh, so my organization does assessments of states' juvenile defense systems. And in the assessments that we've been doing in the last few years, we've really been taking a deep dive into each state's uh, fines and fees. And this little graphic up here is from, I believe it's from our Oregon State Assessment that we've released this year. We've been doing similar graphics in all of our assessments where we map out all of the fees and costs that can be assessed to youth and families as they make their way through the juvenile court system. And as you'll see, it starts from the very beginning. 
uh, it can start with arrest and they can get a fingerprinting fee. If they want to get diverted, if they have an option to not get into the court system, often there's a fee. Lots of courts charge you to even apply to have a public defender and then maybe you have to apply and then you may have to pay for that public defender. And it just winds all the way through. Um, there are cases that we hear about with kids and families charge tens of thousands of dollars and even more than a hundred thousand dollars for the privilege of having their child um, go through the juvenile delinquency system. So how has COVID impacted this? Um, this quote that I just put up there is one that we got from our defender interview program or project that we're doing. And it was, it was striking to me because I feel like I have a decent sense of, of the impact that these fees and costs have. And it hadn't occurred to me um, how this shift in COVID to remote hearings was also itself having a detrimental economic impact. Um, in order to, to participate via Zoom or whatever it is for remote hearings, you have to have the equipment, right? You have to have a computer, you have to have internet access, you have to have camera, microphone, speakers, all those things. That's not a big deal. Uh, you know, when, when my office went remote and I came here to my home and started working, I had a computer and when I needed to buy new headphones, I ordered them, right? It's not a big deal. Um, that's not the case for the youth and families who are in uh, the system. And so this, this quote, the entire workaround for in-person hearings presupposes a position of privilege. Uh, and obviously the, the youth and the families who are in the system don't have those privileges. And then finally, uh, race and the juvenile legal system. I'm sure it will come as no surprise to anybody here um, that youth of color are disproportionately uh, represented in the juvenile legal system. It starts at the very beginning with the school to prison pipeline, like Josh was just talking about, and the disparities increase at every step of the proceedings. So from interaction with law enforcement to arrest to the prosecutor filing charges, at each step, um, the disparities grow. So this chart is from the Burns Institute. Um, it's just one snapshot of one part of the system and it shows youth incarceration in the year 2017. Uh, and th at that point, um, black youth were 4.6 times more likely than white youth to be incarcerated, native youth 2.9 times and Latino youth 1.4 times. So this is even before COVID. Um, so what impact did COVID have? Uh, these next two charts I am showing you are from the Annie E. Casey Foundation. What Casey found is that when COVID initially hit, so from like February, March through May, um, the immediate um, response of the system was to stop or really put the brakes on admissions to juvenile detention facilities. Um, and so because most of the kids moving into those facilities are disproportionately youth of color, the impact that had on disparities is it actually reduced dispar racial disparities in facilities across the country. Um, but that didn't last um, because then in the next couple of months, once that kind of initial putting the brakes on ended, the way that facilities were reducing their population was by releasing youth who are already there. And what happened then is that white youth were much more likely to get released and then the disparities actually increased um, to even greater than they had been before. So how do we strengthen the rights and protect the health of justice involved youth? That's the subject um, of the panel that Josh and I are on here. Um, coming from the National Juvenile Defender Center, uh, it probably won't surprise you that our opinion is that the way that youth get justice is through counsel. Youth cannot get justice in this system if they don't have access to counsel. And what has the COVID um, pandemic and everything happening in 2020 shown us? Um, Early on in the pandemic, so March, April, as all of this was happening, there was so much talk of first responders, doctors, nurses, paramedics, um, the, primarily the medical professionals who were responding to the crisis of the pandemic as our country was trying to figure out what was happening and what to do. And as my organization was working with folks on the front lines and trying to provide resources and trying to help kids who were in facilities, um, it occurred to us that our frontline defenders were also first responders. Um, these kids are in facilities away from their families, um, awaiting court hearings, the whole range of things that kids in the justice system are facing. And it was our juvenile defenders across the country who were their first responders. Um, here's the problem with that. It's been 53 years since the United States Supreme Court said that youth have a constitutional right to counsel and have the same, con largely the same constitutional protections as adults when they face criminal charges. Um, and states, haven't put the systems in place to make that happen. Um, so I'm gonna go through just a couple 
quick um, statistics to show you. Uh, this is from a report called Access Denied that my organization put out on the 50th anniversary of In Re Galt, which is that U.S. Supreme Court decision. Uh, and just a few things that we looked at I want to show you. So this first one, only 11 states provide every child a lawyer regardless of financial situation. So adults and youth qualify for publicly funded counsel if they can't afford to hire counsel on their own. Um, but only these 11 states assume that children don't have the means to hire an attorney. How many, how many teenagers do you know who have the money to go out and hire a defense lawyer? We believe um, that children should be assumed, presumed to be indigent and that counsel should be automatically appointed. Uh, and that the state shouldn't go into a financial essentially investigation of the family's ability to pay because it's the young person's right to counsel and not their families. Um, in addition to that, 36 states actually charge youth for those lawyers. So you get a lawyer appointed, but then costs are assessed. Um, usually at the end of the case, it could be a flat fee. It could be 50 bucks, 100 bucks, 250 bucks. There are states where they actually pass the entire cost of counsel onto the youth and family. So whatever that attorney billed for that case, the court passes that cost on to the youth and family, and they're expected to pay it back. And only 12 states provide for meaningful access to counsel after sentencing. And this is a huge issue, particularly in COVID. Um, the youth who were being detained um, post-sentencing um, and were being held in, in detention facilities where COVID was running rampant, where they couldn't do social distancing, all of those things. Um, for the most part, those youth didn't have access to counsel. And when you don't have access to counsel, you can't petition to the court um, to get you out when crises like this happen. So how do we strengthen the rights and protect the health of justice-involved youth? A um, couple things that are particularly relevant here. One, we have shrunk the system a little bit in COVID. Uh, we have recognized that there's room to shrink it without having any impact whatsoever on public safety. Once we get past COVID, we have to start there. We've got to start from the smaller footprint and we've got to keep reforming the system. Um, and the other thing is we have to ensure that every young person has a great lawyer from the very beginning, from the time that they interact with law enforcement, whether it's in schools or in their community, all the way through um, when the until court supervision ends. Uh, that is how youth access their rights in the system. So that is, uh, let me stop my screen share here and go back to Josh and Steve. Thank so you. We, we have a couple of really great questions. Uh, in the interest of time, I think uh, maybe I'll bunch them together. Um, this first group is for Josh. Um, so let me see if I can get them together. The first one is from um, uh, Claire Goforth, who asks whether there, there are any effective programs that provide support and services for parents of children with disciplinary issues. And April Kelly um, asks whether the, the privatization of almost half of youth confinement facilities will make ending the school to prison uh, pipeline more difficult. And then there's a, um, a financial question from Brandon Fassman, who notes that since most SROs are funded by federal dollars, uh, and we know that we've seen some of those figures, so as he points out, it's not like a school district or a municipality can get rid of an SRO and then use those savings to hire a mental health practitioner or some other counselor. The money goes away with the officers. So what's the role or is there a role for the federal government in guiding policy? So it's a trifecta of questions there, but they're all related, obviously, to uh, your key theme. Yeah, so I'll take them in reverse order because it goes from hard to easy on those for me. <laughs> you know, it's... <laughs> laws get passed and laws can get changed. You know, we have grants that, that fund school resource officers. We don't need to have grants that, that have school resource officers. We can have federal grants that fund counselors in schools. Um, we can have school grant, we can have grants that fund school nurses and school-based health centers. These are things that have passed in the past. You know, a couple jobs ago, I worked at an organization, the National Alliance on School-Based Healthcare, um, we got grants for building school-based uh, health clinics that were giving primary health care. That was part of Obamacare to build up the facilities and funding came through Medicaid. This, this is a problem that can be solved. The money exists. We're just putting it from the wrong place. Uh, the privatization question is an interesting one because I think in the, in the public mind, there's an assumption that private is automatically worse. And I think for people who have visited 
a lot of these public facilities, they're pretty terrible too. There's no sort of distinction between public and private necessarily. The, the public, uh, excuse me, the private for-profit facilities concern me quite a bit. From what I've seen on the COVID tracking, it's incredibly secretive of what's happening there. I have a terrible sense of what is happening in the private for-profit facilities and the public facilities have been much more forthcoming about the number of staff that have tested positive, the youth that have tested positive recoveries. So it's not so much about the quality of the, the, the care, because there are certainly nonprofit private providers who are running group homes, who are um, really helping the kids with their drug addiction problems. Um, it's not... <sighs> I don't have the issues with private providers that a lot of other people in the in the um, progressive community do. And lastly was the question about whether there's good programs for families. And, and I sort of have, I have two good examples here for sort of the lightweight stuff that kids get into trouble with generally in school. Restorative justice programs are great because they bring in adults, usually a parent, but a caring adult who will be looking after this kid. And the restoration is about the relationship between the kid who stole the backpack and the kid whose backpack was stolen, because there's usually a whole bunch of other issues tied up in that. Like any one of us who were kind of bullied a little bit in eighth grade, like we know that it didn't start with, you know, a fight in the locker room, but bringing in a restorative justice counselor can bring out these issues and having caring adults there can help a kid understand that. For the more serious issues, there's family functional therapy, which can last for, I, don't know, I think it's about five months, six months is generally how these work. And to bring in the family as a whole unit to address the problems that have brought the kid in contact with the police as a solution, I think it's been proven to be very effective and very cost effective. I mean, even if it weren't cost effective, I would still be supportive of it. But it's just, generally speaking, these kids who are getting into trouble Either it's piddling stuff that all of us did and a slap on the wrist is probably the right response, or it's a kid with a deep set of needs that need to be addressed. And the facilities are going to be terrible at providing those things because, among other things, they're going to go home at the end of it, right? Like this is not a lifetime placement, thankfully. So you need to give them tools and their family tools to address the underlying problems. And that's where family functional therapy can deal with a lot of those bigger problems. Uh, thanks, Josh. I want to... Um maybe wrap up as we approach the end, to ask both of you kind of a question that really fits with everything we've been talking about this afternoon, is that COVID has opened up a space um, for better or for worse for real change in the in the um, uh, youth justice system just as much as the adult system. Um, and I'm wondering whether both of you think that change uh, and how that change can be exploited uh, for good or ill. And, and with that, maybe if you could for each of you, talk about some of the key stories that you'd like to see uh, reporters write about and investigate um, through 2021 that aren't being covered right now. Maybe over to you, Amy, first, and then we'll move to Josh. Okay, sure. Um, so I absolutely agree that um, that that COVID has changed the system in good and bad ways, and that we'll have to see kind of how we how we are moving forward. So the potentially bad ways um, or potentially harmful ways that we see are things like um, video hearings for courts. Um, it's fine. It makes sense during a pandemic. We understand that they're doing it for health reasons, but there are a lot of problems with video hearings, um, with kids not being able to understand what's going on, with um, a lack of confidential communication between attorneys and their clients. Uh, it's really convenient, though. And so we see a lot of courts saying, oh, maybe we'll just keep doing these video hearings moving forward. We don't have to worry about getting everybody into court. We don't have to worry about transporting kids. Uh, but we have a lot of concerns about continuing video hearings once we're past the public health crisis. Um, so that's kind of a, a COVID thing uh, that's really gotten kicked off that we have concerns about that we hope we don't see moving forward. Um, what we see as being good as having happened during COVID that we hope we can exploit and expand upon are things like shrinking the system. Um, taking a look at the fact that it's actually harmful to take kids out um, of their homes and to put them in these congregate care facilities. And it's easier to, to, to not look that issue in the eye when what you're looking at are kind of long-term health effects. Um, you know, if you've got a, a teenage kid here, 
and the long-term health effect doesn't happen until they're an adult, you don't really consider that when you're a judge and you're making the decision to put to, to detain them. Um, but when you're putting them in a facility and that is putting them at greater risk that day uh, for a deadly virus, it just becomes much more real. Uh, and so we're hoping that, that that shrinking of detention facility of institutionalized youth um, really makes people look at that differently. Um, so we think there's good and bad. Um, we're hopeful that that shrinking of the system is something that we can really build on even once we're past COVID. And stories that we should be looking at for the next year? Um, you know, I, it, it, it's tough because it's, I think it's easy to grab on, you know, we've seen some of these stories where a kid gets out of a detention facility, lots of kids get out um, due to COVID, and then one of those kids goes and robs a store. And that's the story that you see. Um, but we didn't talk about the other 99 kids who got out and didn't rob a store and were, help, were helping their families. And so it's, it's, it's a matter of trying to figure out how to tell the rest of that story. Um, Josh kind of hinted at um, the story in Michigan about the young girl who, um, she was called Grace in the story, um, and she had been um, removed from her home and then ultimately placed in detention uh, for skipping remote school. Um, and those individual stories, I think, are very, very important. Um, when you, a lot of times the stories in local papers when they're covering their local courts are really just about the offense and what happens in court that day. Um, and that really, this is, it's the tip of the iceberg, right? Like what you see is that kid in court that day and what got them there. And there's so much more to that story. And stories like Grace's um, that uh, I think it was ProPublica and the Detroit Free Press published yeah. um, really look at the deeper part of the story and show you how much more happened um, that brought Grace to that to that place. Um, just in the last few days, the Milwaukee paper published an absolutely heart wrenching story about a young girl who committed suicide a couple of years ago in a juvenile detention facility. Um, and yes, we carry that in the crime report. Yes. Okay, yeah, and, and that was a, a an amazing amazingly good um, article. And that really, it breaks down, you know, you if, if you just saw that girl in court one day, all you would see was what happened to her that day. But stories like that show you that she didn't get to court in a delinquency case until absolutely every other system had failed her. And it's that story that gets them into, the, that, gets them into that courthouse door um, that I think is so important because it shows the humanity and it shows, I mean, these are, these are children, right? They're teenagers. It's not their fault that they've gotten there. It's because everything that got them there has failed them. Um, and so I know those stories are hard, um, because you've got to get a young person and their family and their permission to tell those stories. But I think they're so incredibly impactful. Thanks, Amy. Uh, Josh, over to you for the last word. Yeah, so I'd, I'd build on something that um, that Amy was just saying, and it's just a general posture of skepticism toward district attorneys and police that I wish I saw more of in reporting. You know, all of the reporting that you, that you might have seen out of the South Carolina story, quoted the sheriff and quoted the police officer and the spokesman for the police department saying that the police officer behaved appropriately. And we could all see with our own eyes that the police officer did not respond appropriately. And that kind of skepticism, I think, is needed. Skepticism is needed for when there isn't a 17-year-old with the video camera watching what's happening. Um, so I think that the appropriate response that you'd want to see is something from the defenders. There are state-level advocates who I work with in, in every state in this country who can talk about the situation in, in Illinois or Kansas or California with much more specificity. I, I love giving media interviews and yet as much as it's, you know, it's my job and, and I look good with my boss and I get to share it with my mom, but I much prefer to share the, the spotlight with uh, advocates in, you know, Colorado and, and Connecticut who understand the, the levers of power there and may be familiar with the juvenile defenders working these cases. The other thing, and this wasn't my presentation because I was doing school to prison pipeline, but I do have a lot of stuff about coronavirus and its impact on juvenile facilities. I'm going to put in the chat box the, the report that we put out about a month ago. If you follow me on Twitter, and I'm just at Josh Rovner, uh, R-O-V-N-E-R, as you see on screen, every couple of days I'll give another update of the total counts nationwide, where the cases are. That's just what we know of. You know, and I think that there's a lot of questions to be asked about what is happening in the facilities for uh, not just the number of cases, 
But what is happening to the kids who are left behind? Is education still happening? Are the kids effectively in solitary confinement and it's being called medical quarantine? Is visitation still happening? If visitation isn't still happening, that, you know, is anything being done to connect the kids with their family, you know, to make sure that people on both ends of a video call can actually see and hear each other with some regularity? So those are things that I'd really like to, to know what's happening. And there ought to be answers to this. You know, the private providers are making millions of dollars and ought to be able to answer the question of what's happening in their facilities. And that's been the black box for me on the, the COVID work that I've been doing. It's not what, not knowing what's happening there. And the report, if you read through it, you'll see good examples of states like Utah that have made visitation easier as much as we at the sentencing project want to see the kids go home. Some of them aren't going home. So what are you going to do to help the kids stay connected with their family at a time that visitation has been canceled? So um, we have to uh, leave it there, but thanks to both of you. Um, some of you have been asking whether the slides uh, and other materials will be available. And yes, the answer is they will. We will put them on our conference page um, and post them and I'll send you the link. Um, and we'll also um, uh, give you the resource um, contact info for all the speakers from today and from the previous weeks. We haven't got them up yet, but they'll be on, a, on our page. So you can uh, use them as your, you know, put them in your virtual Rolodex or whatever you want to do with them uh, for future use. Um, but again, uh, to both of you guys, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's been a long afternoon and I hope a productive one for everyone. Um, we will be closing in a, a couple of minutes, but I'm, um, as I said earlier, just to remind you, we'll have the video recordings of our first two sessions up shortly. And this one will probably take uh, another week or so, but we will have them up as well. Um, and again, um, you know, the next time we see each other um, will be November 5th, um, and we will talk, not surprisingly, about the politics of change. Uh, I think we can't avoid that. We don't know what's going to happen between now and then. Uh, this is not an audience I need to talk to about uh, um, the need to vote, I know, but um, I wish you all a stress-free couple of days as we uh, move into what's going to be an interesting, very interesting week. Um, but thank you all for joining us um, for this afternoon, and we will see you uh, again very shortly. Uh, stay, stay, uh, keep, keep watch on the emails that I'll send you just to remind you about our, um, our timing, and the link will be the same. And also our panelists uh, today and in previous weeks are also welcome to join us. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.